Hey, it's Peter Day. Welcome back to this podcast. I know it's been a little bit of a delay since I've made an episode, um, but welcome back. So in this audio, we're going to talk about cash flow and developing it in a stronger way. I know it's something that have been on a lot of businesses' minds lately. It might be the economy too. And you know what I feel like? I feel like this year there's been a a big divide in... Um, affiliate marketers for some reason remember if you're listening to this audio we're in the affiliate marketing industry i know these audios start to pick up a wider audience now with all the entrepreneurial insight and personal development and stuff like that but in essence we're in the business right now of promoting other people's products whether that's a insurance plan or whether it's a legal services or whether it's a solar roofing, windows, whatever the industry is, our primary business model is promoting these other people's products. And I feel like this year in particular, for the first time in my experience in the industry, I feel like there's a big difference of affiliates that are succeeding and affiliates that are struggling. Um, We've been doing this for about 12 years, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the first time we're kind of experiencing this divide is in a harder economic time. So I think it's having some kind of impact on the overall landscape. Because when I went to a lot of trade shows this year, the verdict was there was some affiliates that were struggling, but then what's a little bit concerning is there was a lot of affiliates that were crushing it last year that that have not been doing as well this year. It's been lower volume. It's been harder to find things that have been working. Some of the things that were very hot in the beginning of the year or last year have now become more saturated. And I think it's just another lesson to where we need to be way, we need to be ahead of that curve. And, you know, if if the risk is for something to stop working or to get saturated, then the best way to hedge against that is to you know, make sure it doesn't happen ahead of time and not be caught on the wrong side of that fence, essentially, if it if it does happen. But going back to the cash flow thing, so in terms of having good cash flow, a lot of times having good cash flow requires good preparation. I mean, it sounds a little bit obvious, but it, it really does. It's a little bit hard to be in the midst of things and then suddenly be trying to work out your cash flow problems. It's not impossible, but it's it's much, much smarter um, to be prepared ahead of time. For example, we've been working all year getting a pretty beefy line of credit with our bank. And um, it's kind of, it's, believe it or not, it's not that easy to actually get the lines of credit anymore. It's um, You'd be so surprised. About three or four years ago, when the interest rates were low and the economy was really hot, it was so easy to get the line of credit, just just in general. I mean, whether it was through a bank or some kind of lending institution, I mean, it was just so easy. Um, but lately, it's been so much more challenging to actually get a line of credit. It's just, it's kind of nuts. I started applying for a line with my bank last November or something, and then it wasn't approved until... January and then even when it was approved it was approved for very small and it made no sense either because our business had a lot of revenue and had a lot of profitability last year and I asked the bank well wh- why is the line of credit so small and they said Peter quite frankly we're just not giving out much lines right now that was the answer they said they said they said if you came to us years ago we would have approved you for a lot more money but they said right now we're just not giving out much lines we're holding back and we're being more conservative And what my banker told me, quote unquote, is he thinks that lines of credit are going to be something of the past. He says that the banks are going to rarely give them out. If they do, they're not going to be that beefy amounts. And he felt like they were also going to grandfather in um, lines of credit that already exist too. And if they wanted to stop giving the line of credit, they would convert it over to a, um, a term loan if you still had a balance on it. So it's just something to keep in mind. What, what this all means to me is that if any of this is true, which I guess it could be with this one particular bank, I mean, which, by the way, is a big bank, I'm not naming them just because I need to be careful what I, you know, actually say about certain institutions on the podcast. But 
if if this bank is cutting back on these lines, what it makes me think is that it's maybe in our best interest to lock in some good lines um, ahead of time, especially because he told me that the existing lines would be grandfathered in, it would be harder to get one moving forward and stuff. So that's a process that we've been going through. And again, this is all preparatory. It's like we're, we don't even need the line of credit right now, but I'm doing all of this work to get the line of credit. And it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work too, by the way, like to get a very sizable line of credit. I'm talking about a seven-figure line of credit. It, it's not just fill out something. It, it's serious. It's like you use so much paperwork, so many P&Ls, account receivables reports, personal financial statements, the list goes on. I mean, literally, you know, this week I probably spent a few hours alone just finishing some final documents for this kind of thing. It's just a tremendous amount of um, of of work, and it even requires, f like, getting on the phone and, and doing phone interviews and stuff with the underwriting. It's, it's much more serious than just point and, you know, apply and stuff. But we're going through this process because we're thinking to ourselves, well, this could be a preparatory thing. You know, let's say we're scaling in the future and we're running really hard on something. Why not have a million plus dollars of extra line of credit at our disposal, right? So it's just something that you might want to be thinking about ahead of time. And this is the kind of thing where you have to be preparing ahead of time because it takes so long to get one of these things and there's so much paperwork and there's so much scrutiny and there's so much process that... It's not really the type of thing where you can do it at the last minute. I mean, let's say you're you're scaling up a big campaign or you have some cash flow needs and it's September, for example, you're not going to be able to reach out to your bank and get some beefy line of credit in, in the last 30 days. I mean, trust me, I tried to do that last year and it didn't happen. I reached out to um, the bank in October to start the process thinking I would have a line um, quickly, I didn't actually get my line of credit until about January or the new year or something. So the process took about October, November, December, January. It took about four months. Um, not actually sure why it took that long, but that was the case for my experience. So it's just a learning lesson. Oh, and by the way, there's also this process too with these lines of credit where they might not give you the full amount you want off the get-go, and then you might have to do increases the line. So this line of credit that I've been talking about, has, it's it's been such a work in progress. So I started applying last October. They only approved us for $250,000, which is like their entry level size. They And what's absolutely ridiculous about it um, as well is that our financials were just really, really strong last year. I mean, the revenue of our business was about $50 million and our, our EBITDA our net profit was like $10 million and the bank would only give us a quarter million dollar line of credit. I said, guys, this is absolutely absurd. Like, why are you giving you know, 200 grand line of credit to a business that's doing... So the whole thing is just kind of nuts. And then, so anyway, the banker told me, well, you got to start small. And then what you got to do is a couple months later, we can ask for an increase. So, uh, you know, we got the line and then this summer, we asked for an increase. Well, the increase still wasn't that sizable. They increased the line to about 750 grand, which is better, actually. It's something that becomes meaningful. The thing about our business is if you're spending 500 grand a day or 300 grand a day on advertising, if you get a line of credit for 200 grand, it's nothing. It's like half a day of, of advertising. It doesn't do anything. Um, and I was telling the banker that I said, guys, like our business, we're, we literally spend three hundred thousand dollars a day, two hundred grand on a low day, every day on advertising. Like we need a line that's large enough to at least carry us through like a week of spending, or like half a week or something. It's just we got to do better than this. So. The reason I'm telling all of this is to impress upon you that if you're actually serious about getting this kind of liquidity and getting this access to capital, you need to be starting ahead of time. Starting 30 days ahead of time is way too late because it's not only the process of getting approved for a line of credit, but there's also this process of, of raising the line. I mean, don't be surprised if you apply for a line of credit and they give you like nothing. They give you 200 grand or they give you 100 grand, they give you 50 grand, they give you some entry level thing 
And then, but it's just all a part of the process, I guess. So what we did with ours is we applied for the first, you know, we applied for the line, we did the increase, we got our increase from 250 to 750. That was this summer. So it's like, okay, fine, we're starting to get somewhere with this thing. And then what I've been doing over the last week is getting our next increase to 1 million. I guess 1 million is like the next dollar amount that they're willing to do on these things. And then, so guys, this is a serious work in progress. So, ne so now we're one year later. You got to remember, I started this whole line of credit process last October. We're one year later. And I finally potentially have a line of credit for one million dollars. I, I have obviously the 750, but it, we're, I'm just showing you how much ahead of time you actually have to be with these kind of cash flow things if you need access to capital like this. Now, it's just such a process. Now, what the banker told me too is okay, he said once you have this line of credit for a million, he's like, that's basically where you know, small business banking caps out. So he says, okay, if you want lines of credit that are larger than that, he says the next step is we have to upgrade you to institutional level banking. So, and then institutional level banking is only available to businesses that do over, I think, $50 million a year. So we didn't quite qualify last year with $49 million, but then this year we'll qualify for institutional. So it's, it's, is is all the steps in the process, right? So the next step of this line of credit would be to get the million bucks. And then the next step would be, we need to upgrade our entire banking experience to what's called this institutional grade banking, where it's basically a different uh, level bank account within the bank. You can only get it if your business does, I guess, a few years north of $50 million of revenue, or if your rep decides that, you know, even one year of hitting that metric is good enough to make the upgrade. And then what I'm being told is with this institutional grade banking, you can then get access to really beefy lines of credit. He told me once I go institutional level, then I can get lines of credit that are like 2 million, 5 million. It starts to be some really serious, um, access to funding. So that that's on my to do list probably for May, honestly, because it's just it's all part of that. You got to wait for the tax returns to come out, then you got to apply for it. Right. So it's, it's, I'm sharing all this just to tell you that if you need cash flow, it's not always an instant thing, it needs to be something that you're thinking about six months ahead of time, or maybe even a year ahead of time. Now, I am going to share on this podcast some strategies to 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 help cash flow in the short term okay but because when it comes to getting lines of credit or a big line of credit or going through the process of raising the line of credit um, and all that stuff as you can see it's no simple process the only way this is going to be a simple process is, is if you happen to find a bank that's just like a lot more laid back than than my bank um and again, I'm not using a random bank. I'm just using one of the main top tier um, banks in the country. So it's not like I'm using an obscure name either. But, you know, let me know too, by the way, just let me know if you if you guys are working with a bank that's much more laid back about this process, like you apply and you just get a million bucks in a heartbeat or something on a line. I mean, let me know because I would potentially even explore that for myself. But some some strategies here to get faster cash flow. I have two strategies, okay? The first strategy is to spend money. This is assuming you're running internal traffic. If you're brokering, I guess it's a different story. Um, but we, as a company, we run only internal now. I mean, we used to do some brokering years ago. We converted the business model to internal only, number one, for more control and compliance. And also, when you're running internally, it's a higher profit margin. If you're brokering something, you're only going to get about 15 to 20% profit margin because that's kind of the industry standard. I mean, what kind of broker brokers an offer and then puts the margin to where they're making, you know, like 70% um, margin. It's just not, it's not realistic. And it's also frowned upon. I mean, if you're a broker and you get an offer for 20 bucks, then you're trying to only pay your publisher. 10. If the publisher 
like even gets wind that you're an affiliate network or something and you're trying to take like some 80% profit margin, it's it, it could also like lose your reputation. So the whole network thing, in my opinion, has just been a dying um, business model across the board, at least in more stricter industries. I mean, I get it. There's still networks that are really, really thriving in like VSL and Nutra and e-commerce and stuff. And I actually think, in my opinion, that the network game is a pretty good model for that kind of stuff. But in terms of more strict industries like legal, mass tort, insurance, I personally believe the play is to be producing your own internal traffic. And if you're producing your own internal traffic, you do have some levers you can pull. So for example, one recommendation here for more cash flow is to get lines of credit with the platform that you're operating on. So if you're a big player on Google, you can get a good Google rep and you can get a line of credit with Google. Now, where cash flow can really become really boosting is when you combine mechanisms together. So there's three level levers that are really on the top of my mind right here for cash flow. The first is just having access to um, lines of credit if you need it. And again, that's not an overnight process. You probably have to start applying now to have any kind of beefy line by next summer. I'm, I'm very serious. You probably get approved. If you apply now, you'll get approved for something by the end of the year. They'll then want you to do a credit line increase and some kind of renewal probably in April when the tax returns are filed. And then you might have some kind of beefy number by the summer. If you find a faster bank or a more lenient, looser bank, let me know. But that's been the case a lot of times. Now, so when you do that, okay, let's say you have a line of credit and let's say you also have a line of credit with your ad platform. Let's say you're running on Google. Let's say you're running on Facebook ads. You can get lines of credit with these institutions. You can get a line of credit with Google. It's not that hard to apply for. You just need a Google rep that you have a relationship um, with and then all you have to do is ask them to um, apply for the credit terms on your accounts and then you can get a credit line with Google. If you're on Facebook, you can get credit lines directly from Facebook. Another option, and this is something we do as well, is you can work with a um, an agency, like you can get Facebook accounts from agency providers and those providers can provide you a credit line. So. Another way for caster, faster cash flow is the easiest lever to pull, which is faster pay terms with your buyers too. I have a very, very large buyer that I'm going to be on top of on Monday for faster pay terms because they're, if I don't get faster pay terms, I'm going to have to be waiting for possibly one to two million dollars at a time. And that's just, I, I don't know. It's just a little uncomfortable, honestly, for me right now at my size of business. You know what's interesting is I feel a lot of this stuff is relative, though. Like, I, I say that I'm uncomfortable outlaying $1 to $2 million on a single exposure right now. I say that now, but then if my business down the line is producing like $800,000, $800 million a year, I might say on a podcast at that time, well, $1 to $2 million is nothing. And I feel like a lot of these numbers are relative. I mean, I remember when I start, first started my business, one of the most stressful, like, you know, things was that I got stiff 20 grand. And now, because our business size is larger, it's like we got stiff like eight grand or 20 grand. And it's like we haven't even been really batting an, an eye on it. I'm still a little frustrated about it. But it's, it, again, I'm not saying it's all relative. It's really all relative to the the numbers you're doing and the, some of this stuff is just a cost of doing business like if you're doing business with a hundred clients and some like scumbag or something you know stiffs you for like eight thousand bucks it's like what do you it, it's a little bit outside of your control i mean what are, were, you, were you really supposed to see it coming that you know what are you supposed to do so um you, you do need to kind of factor these things into your maybe mindset a little bit where it's just you know, maybe it's to be expected to some degree, potentially. I mean, if you if you work with enough people, you're going to run into some people that just don't want to um, pay. But 
the the thing about this business is that more often than not it, it's not usually been people that do not want to pay the issue has been people that just just can't pay and and even the can't pay by the way is a bunch of baloney you know what i've started to do recently brand new thing um it's kind of aggressive as well. I, I've, I've started to get personal guarantees, okay? Because what I realize is if you have a contract with a company and then the company says that they cannot pay you, your only recourse is with that company, okay? And the issue is that company can just close their doors and then there's nothing you can do because your contract was with the company does that make sense like let's say right i i i'm working on a contract right now i actually brought it up with someone this morning believe it or not and i just signed one of these things a couple weeks ago where i've started to make some contracts that are not actually made out to just the company like i add, i'm adding a personal guarantee into the contract so it's saying, you know, this contract is between optimized to convert and, you know, you know, so and so media, but and it says in the contract, but in the case that X media is not able to pay, then the owners of X media and I list out, I'm literally listing out like the owner's name address, social security, if the company's not able to pay, then the owners are personally liable and responsible for paying the outstanding invoices or invoice. And I, I haven't been doing this with all companies, but I've been doing this with companies where I feel like are a little bit more risky. You have to realize that 90% of the time that we've been not paid, it's been because the company is just some small up and coming failure company. I mean, that that's if you want to avoid like 90% of every single no pay, possibly stay away, stay away from startup companies that just started in the last one or two years, stay away from startups and stay away from companies where it's like one guy owns the company and it's not like a legit thing. It's just like one guy he has no team, he maybe has a business partner, and they have like $30,000 in their bank account, they are probably going to stiff you if they're not able to pay the bill. It's just because they don't have, they, it's not like a big um, business, right? It's, it's just like two guys that are running the whole show. You don't know how much money they have in the bank. They probably have something, right? They probably have like 50 grand or like 100 grand like in their entire bank account. But it's like guys, that that doesn't really work. I mean, it works if it works, but then it quickly doesn't work if it doesn't work. You got to realize some of these other companies out there that are big companies, 1000 employees, 500 employees, these companies have like 400 million dollars or more in in their in their balance sheets and stuff. So if something goes sour and they don't get paid by one of their vendors or something breaks in the supply chain, you'll probably still get paid. Why? Because they're able to absorb those kind of things. The risk with working with these one man shop kind of deals is that these one man shops, they don't have the ability to really absorb things, nor do they always want to absorb things. Like if they if they only have 100 grand in the bank, they owe you 140 grand and then they don't get paid by someone else. Guess what? You're going to be, you know, chasing them down for money and you might get stiffed your entire 140 grand because they want to just steal it from you to kind of make up for the, it's So what you got to do is you got to number 1 maybe just avoid this type of profile in the first place. Number two, get faster pay terms with them. Be like, listen, I, I'm just like a little bit uncomfortable. Like it's a newer business. It's not that large of an organization. I'm happy to send traffic, but I'm only going to send it if you pay me every week. And in fact, once we scale up, I really want you to be sending the invoice twice a week, just so I have a strong um, confidence and peace of mind in this scale. Okay. 
And then what you could do is you also get them to sign a contract. So if they do not pay your invoice, you say that the you put down the owner's name, the owner's address, and their socialists, and you put into the contract, and you make it clear with them where if the invoice is not paid, they're still liable on a personal level. Because then what you could do is if their business goes under, you can still take that contract to like a small claims court, or you can take that contract somewhere, and you can say, listen, they're still personally liable to pay this um this invoice they 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 can't just say that their business closed down they have to fork it up and why i'm so upset about some of this stuff sometimes is some of these dudes they say they can't pay and then they just have money in their personal like bank account it's just bogus it's just bogus like right now I think I talked about it on another podcast, but for me, it's not even the dollar amount. It's more like the principle. The principle of some of these people not paying the bills is is so frustrating. I We're dealing right now, and for the last three months, we've been dealing with a $24,000 no pay. In my opinion, I don't think it's the largest dollar amount. If the person doesn't pay, I will likely be moving on. I might do something aggressive just to try to get the money. If they don't pay by January, I might just actually file like a lawsuit, like out of the blue or something. I might just just do something like very aggressive just to see if I can um, maybe scare them into a settlement or something. Um, Because by the way, I've learned the whole collections thing has not been that... I, I'm I'm learning as I go, and what I'm learning is that if someone doesn't want to pay you, you might have to go to the most aggressive um, end of the spectrum, like very quickly, um, or at least when. Because trust me, I've tried all the tricks. I've tried sending the bill to collections people. I've tried using these different collections brokers, and I've I've tried all of that, and it doesn't really work because. If the collections people are knocking on their door, they can just ignore the collections people. It's not like the collections people is actually the court or anything. It's just the collections is just someone else that's just badgering them for money. And they can just they can just not pick up the phone for the collections. But what I learned is that if someone doesn't pay you, what you can do is you can file a lawsuit. And if you file a lawsuit, what happens is the person on the other end has to respond to the lawsuit. If they don't, it can be an automatic judgment for the lack of response to the lawsuit. So what I'm thinking of doing moving forward on no pays, if there are any or some no pays, is if I've tried hard enough and the person's just giving me the runaround, I might just go to the lawyer, we just write up and file the lawsuit, and then next thing you know, this person who's been like giving us a runaround suddenly has a lawsuit. Then they have two options. Option one is they're going to have to fight the lawsuit, which they're not going to be able to do because the lawsuit is a lawsuit against them not paying the bill, and they're not going to be able to prove that like they don't really have to pay the bill. So they, they wouldn't be able to win the lawsuit, and then and then they're going to have to respond to the lawsuit. And think about it. If someone doesn't have money, the last thing they're going to want to do is um, fight a lawsuit. I mean, because they would be fighting a lawsuit that they would then lose. So honestly, I think the strategy is going to work pretty well. And I I don't want to... Uh, trust me, It's if someone owes you money, it's best to try to collect it naturally because it does cost a little bit of extra money. It's like, if I want to go the lawsuit... Uh, you know, approach, I got to go pay, I got to go pay a lawyer like $4,000 to write it all up, to file it or whatever. Maybe I can find cheaper, right? Maybe it, if it, I can source it around, right? But it's like, you would have to pay money for someone to file. And then, trust me, it's not, it's not going to go to court. Cause if the person, if the person only owes 20 grand, they're not going to want to go to court over the, the 20 grand. They, what would happen is they get the lawsuit. They're like, Oh my goodness. Like this Peter guy was actually serious about like wanting his invoices paid. And then what they would be doing is they would be, they would be calling, they would be settling very fast. Like suddenly out of the blue after six months of saying they have no money. My guess is if we did that, they would suddenly be calling out of the blue saying, okay, um, yeah, we want to make this right. Um, can we offer to pay, you know, $10,000? Could we just like offer half of the invoice? I, 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 I would guarantee you that if we did that, suddenly, suddenly money would come out of the woodworks that was not there before. 
and they would either be paying the full invoice or we would be negotiating part of the invoice, right? So it's just, it's so frustrating the, 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 the lack of like ethics and just, it's just why can't people just do the right thing if they owe an invoice, just pay the invoice. Like, why does it have to get to the point where, you know, someone is like filing a lawsuit to like scare them into like just paying the bill that they owe anyway and stuff. It's just, there's, you got to be careful who you work with, but going back to this cash flow thing, if you can do these three things in combination, you can boost the cash flow a lot. So number one, get lines of credit and prepare ahead of time. Number two, get, um, get credit lines with the institutions, like get credit lines with Google, Facebook, and then you could also get credit lines with providers that rent out, like providers that give out Google and Facebook accounts. You can get credit lines with them. And then where you can get really big credit lines with these platforms is if you do a combination of both. I mean, let's say some of your ads you run on your own Facebook accounts where you have your own credit line with your own Facebook agency, but then other Facebook accounts you run on other agencies, right? And then you can start, it adds up. Like you can get a lot of credit line. Because let's say you have $500,000 credit line with one and another and another. Another thing you can do for cash flow too is obviously just get more beefy. Um, you can be running Facebook accounts that have your own credit cards behind them that are, um, those only go so far though. I mean, the credit cards, I, I it's kind of rare that the credit cards allow you to put like seven figures on the card. But um, here's what I'm saying is when you do these three mechanisms in tandem, it, it could be a big leverage um, point. So let's just say, for example, you prepared ahead of time and you secured a line of credit. You don't have to use that line of credit. It could just sit there. What we do with our lines of credit is like once or twice a year, we, we take them out for like a week. We literally draw the money for like a week and then we pay it back. The only reason we do that is just to prove to the bank that we're utilizing it so they don't take it away. So the lines of credit can just be sitting there. So if you have lines of credit, then you have credit lines with your platforms and agency providers. And then on top of that, you go to all of your clients and get faster pay terms. That could be something that three X's or more your cash flow because all of a sudden you have credit with the Facebook accounts or the Google accounts, so you don't have to pay those right away suddenly money's coming in faster from the clients. And then once you do need to pay back the Facebook accounts, you can then draw money from lines of credit to pay those back. And then when all of that is said and done, you you might not actually be drawing into any kind of hard cash that you have until like two to five weeks later, whatever the time frame is. Now, I have to give a disclaimer and be very transparent here that if you are using borrowing like credit lines of the accounts and lines of credit, you have to be careful. You have to be wise about what you're doing it. And you have to be able to pay these things back. I'm not advising people to do this recklessly. I'm not advising people to do this in some kind of like, you know, fantasy type of way where they're just going to like spend a lot of money and like hope that it's, it's not, no, no, no. It needs to be very, very calculated. If you're going to borrow any money, you need to know as a fact that you're going to be able to pay that money back. Because if you're not able to pay back money that you borrowed, that could put you out of business, okay? So just make sure you're very, very smart about it. Don't do anything that, you know, that is not the right thing for you to do. And don't take all of this as financial advice. Take this as you know, what we've been doing and make your own decisions based off of your own business and everything. But I hope these things found you helpful. And, um, you know, sometimes I just get so passionate about these different topics because it's, it would be a very, very easy, you know, world out there if everyone was just doing the right thing. If everyone was just paying their bills, if everyone was just you know, not holding back money for no reason. But sometimes things do happen and catastrophes happen to certain businesses. And that's why you need to diversify. You don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. I mean, there was a pretty sad story that happened to an affiliate that we know. I mean, he was really putting all of his eggs, like mostly in this one advertiser and the advertiser started having issues and didn't pay him and it was like kind of like 80% of what he was doing and stuff so what you need to do is I recommend treating your business 
almost like a stock portfolio. And I've said this a lot of times on different podcasts. Like, would you ever have a portfolio of stocks and in the whole and in the whole portfolio is just like Apple as like 80% of it and then Tesla as like the other 20%, right? You probably want it because you would be thinking to yourself, if Apple goes under, your portfolio is going to go down 80%. And then you're also going to be thinking to yourself, if Tesla takes a hit, your portfolio is going to go down like 20% because of the Tesla portion. People that build a good stock portfolio, they diversify enough. It's kind of like Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio. Think of, think of your business kind of like the all-weather portfolio, right? You're not going to put all your eggs in one basket. You're going to be spread out. If you're working directly, it doesn't even matter. Network or no network, it's all the same. By the way, you could be stiffed by a network. You could be stiffed by a direct advertiser. You could be stiffed by a agency, a marketing company. You could be stiffed by anyone. Uh, uh, just because you're working with a network or you're running traffic through an affiliate network, it doesn't mean you're any safer. In fact, those people have usually stiffed the most because they've come up with some bogus of it's the networks have usually stiffed even more than the direct ones in that than in my experience. Um seriously, because usually what's happened with the networks is they've done something wrong and then because they've done something wrong that's outside of your control, then you know next thing you know, you're getting stiff because something someone else did or something they did, they lost the offer, someone that wasn't you did something they weren't right. So what I recommend doing is treating your business like a stock portfolio and follow the principles of a portfolio manager, right? There's, um, if you follow like Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, for example, he's pretty clear that he doesn't allocate any more than 20% of his wealth into one sector, and then he doesn't allocate any more than 5% of any of his allocation into a single stock or a single name. So if you start treating your business like that, you're going to have a safer business. I mean, let's be honest. Like, are, are is your business actually spread out to 5%, 5%, 5%? Probably not. When you look at your business right now, you're probably like, oh, sh like, oh man, like, yeah, I have like 60% of my volume with this client. I got like 30% of all my monthly volume with this client and then the rest of the clients are like 5%, 5%, 5% or something. And the issue with that is I get it. You might have to bear with that a little bit in the short term, but you should at least be striving. You should be at least going in the direction of getting more spread out because what I just articulated is basically a 70% Apple portfolio, a 20% like Tesla portfolio, and then a 10% other stock portfolio. If you have one client that's comprising 70%, another, right? So you need to think of this in terms of risk management. There's a whole diversification risk management, and it would just be absolutely crazy to put all your eggs in one basket, have that basket fail. And then I feel like that's what's happened with a lot of these affiliates. Remember I said in the beginning of the audio, I feel like this year there's been like struggling that maybe wasn't there last year. I think some of the struggles is affiliates put all their eggs into a few baskets and then they're not even struggling because of no pays. They're struggling because the caps are lower and the states are not as much, right? So there was a lot of affiliates that put, I'm not going to name these things, even though some of you guys probably know who I'm referring to. There's a lot of affiliates that that put their eggs into like three or four names in certain vertical, okay? And they were getting a lot of cap from from those names. They were getting a lot of states. Like if these offers ran on Facebook, they used to run in 30 states or 35 states. They're only running in like five or seven states now. And that's a really big hit because the fewer states you have, the more expensive the traffic could cost, right? So, but again, this is all an issue of not enough diversifying. They were too reliant. These affiliates were too reliant on these three or four big names. They were they were comfortable with the caps. They were comfortable with how many states they were was there. They said, I don't, you know, I'm just gonna sit back, relax, and party. And guess what? It's like the rug got pulled under from a lot of them because it's less caps, 
less states and less overall top line revenue. And then all of that cap and all of that allocation has been basically shifted even, you know, tighter to just a few like prime affiliates and stuff. And then next thing you know, there's a bunch more affiliates struggling and kind of some other ones maybe succeeding the same as before. But again, the issue is just not being spread out as, as, as much. I mean, if you were running a campaign and the campaign was just being propped up by three or four names and a lot of states, which was maybe unusual for the industry, you could have probably seen it coming that in 12 months, maybe there would be some little shifts or some little turbulence that would affect the performance of that campaign. Like if you only have four clients and like two of them lower their cap in a huge way, well, I mean, let's just be honest. It's not like we, this, you should have saw that coming, right? So it's really important to be prepared ahead of time. Make sure you're diverse. Make sure you don't have all of the eggs in, you know, three or four bass. I mean, the, the biggest issue that I've been seeing these days with a lot of people is it's not like they're putting all their eggs in one basket. They're putting all their eggs in like three or four baskets is the reality of it. So, but it's a huge problem. I mean, if you, I would say 90% of people I talk to that are affiliates, they, they have all of their eggs in like three or four baskets. It's not just a couple, right? So it's a huge so instead of having all your eggs in three or four baskets, try, try to have all your eggs in like 35 baskets or something. Just spread it out. Get like 40 clients or something and then have the um, traffic be more distributed, like 5%, 5%, 5%. Maybe at tops you have one doing like 10%. That's a kind of little beefier or something. But even if that's the case, even if you do have one that's a little top heavy, you should be, you know, your goal should be to... to make it not so top heavy by getting more clients and stuff to spread it out. So this is just some advice for myself. Um, I don't really have any sales pitch here, nor have I really had in the other webinars. I can tell you that um, I'll, I'll say it just in case there's a good fit, okay? I am very actively looking for a CEO's assistant right now. I actually, I have an interview with someone um, today, this afternoon, and who knows, like maybe this person will be a good fit. Maybe not. We'll find out. I've done four interviews already and I turned down everyone. I just didn't think they were up to par. I mean, we're really, really picky. But if you're listening to this audio, chances are you're probably not the right fit for this position if... um if you're, you know, running ads and you know what I mean, it's a different skill set. But if you're listening to this audio and you know someone that could be a really, really good CEO's assistant. So what a CEO's assistant would do is a little bit of everything. They would be doing personal stuff. They would be doing business stuff. It's like a personal assistant, but at a higher level. So a CEO's assistant would be able to talk to clients. They would be able to handle important things. Like if I had a CEO's assistant, for example, I could have had the CEO's assistant probably handle the entire application for the line of credit. It would have taken a little bit of, of, of paper signing. They would have had to sign like the power of attorney thing to actually do it on behalf of my name. They can't just like forge my signature and stuff. But if I had, if I had a, a personal, if I had a CEO's assistant, I would have been able to save, you know, like two to four hours of time on, on the credit line application. I, there's a lot of personal stuff. And this is a position that I am going to be very actively looking for, I believe, come January. I'm putting out some feelers now, just in case the right type of person comes along. But basically, the person I'm looking for, for this position, the position would be, it's it's more of a job than than commission focus. So the the position would be more, it would be heavier on base salary. So there, there would be a six-figure um, salary. It would be a six-figure base salary um, because it's extremely high level. It's, it's like, it's the reason I've had such a difficult time actually hiring for this position is because of how high level the position, it's like one of the highest level positions in like the company. Um, 
so that's why it's been it's been so challenging to find the right because I'm so picky about who am I going to get for the position. It needs to be a superstar. So the pay would be pretty well. It would probably be a um, hundred thousand dollars a year base starting salary. But then what we would probably do is offer bonuses. Like if the company does well, they can do well. They can get some bonuses. And the person that's the right fit for this position, they would have to be looking for more of a steady job rather than a commission opportunity. If someone is really hungry for commissions, they should just be a media buyer um, or a salesperson or something like that that's really like commission driven. That being said, we actually offer commissions for all of our team, though. It doesn't actually matter if our team is a a customer service person or an account manager or a salesperson. We, we've we set up an interesting model where everyone in the company is incentivized. So we, it's something that we did, which I believe is very smart. We took, what we did was we took every position that wasn't commission-based and we're now offering um, commission structure and bonuses on top of base pay. Literally, our tech guy that sets up offers is now literally working like 13 hours a day because he's so motivated to earn a commission come January or something. So th- it's a very interesting thing we've done here is because I was kind of concerned if these folks are not incentivized with commission or upside, it's just, you know, I mean, it could get a little boring. I mean, I I, I personally would be pretty... Uh, I wouldn't be very happy if I just had no upside in my work. Like if the only thing I could earn was like, you know, a base salary and there was absolutely no way to grow. So that's a very interesting thing we've implemented this year is we've, we now offer a commission structure and tiered bonuses for everyone in the company, whether it's a tech person, we even have the accounting person, um, you know, able able to get, even our accounting person is working there so hard because like if they produce, if the company earns certain amount, like even our accounting person could get bonus. Like it's so motivating for the company. And as a result, we've been able to take a dream team that's already extremely good. And we've been able to set it on a whole nother level. Um, So I'm really happy with my team. We're looking to add one addition to the team, but we need to find the right person. The CEO's assistant needs to be someone who is not so much looking for commission. They're they're more looking for a solid job, okay? They, they need to be looking for a more solid, steady job. That's a competitive job. But then we're still going to offer commission, okay? It might not be the biggest commissions in the world, but we're still going to offer commissions. We're going to say, hey, listen, if you produce this, if you help the company produce this, There's going to be some commissions, right? So it's going to be a combination of solid competitive salary plus commission. And this person will be responsible for being my assistant is is greater than a personal assistant. It's a CEO's assistant is the better definition of it. It's helping with personal things, business things. It's This person would be wearing many hats. Like, let's say I got a call from a client and I was busy. I can, this is how high level this uh, person would have to be. I would have to say, you know, CEOs, are say, this person needs to be the caliber to where they can just jump on a call with like the best client that I have and take care of business. And that's not everyone. That's not, you know what I mean? It's It takes a really high level person and sharp person for this position. So basically what I'm putting out here is a little bit of a feeler to where if for some reason you're listening to this audio and you personally are like, yeah, you know, I could be this CEO's assistant for the next 10 years. It's not going to be a short-term position either. I mean, if this, you know, whole thing, if we find the right person and it works out, we're expecting this position to be, you know, the next 10 plus years. I mean... I was reading a book by John Maxwell, that leadership guy. He said that his personal assistant has been with him for the last 30 years. That's how loyal his personal assistant, 30 years. I mean, that's incredible. And he was using it as an example of leadership. He was saying basically his leadership is so strong and his company culture is so strong that his personal assistant has been wanting to stick with him for 30 years. That's crazy. 
that's the type of culture we're looking to build in our company where it's like people do not want to leave. It's just so good they can't get it elsewhere and they don't want to leave. And it's not just a money thing. It's it, because if all you're doing is motivating people with money, it's not going to work because what if you pay someone so much money but the culture is not very good in um, – the company, then the person could leave anyway, because like, who cares if you're getting paid more money, but then the environment is not as good, or the team is not as, you know, understanding, or, you know, supportive, or accommodating, or respectful, like, there's so much more than just money, who cares if you get paid 30% more at another job, if you don't like it as much, personally, I would rather be paid well, and happy than to be paid more and then unhappy with what I was doing. So you have to keep that in mind when you're just in general, if you have a team, if you're part of a team, if you're building a team, it is more important that you're paid well and you're really, really happy and passionate about what you're doing than to just be you know, swayed or wanting more money with something that might not actually be as good of a culture. I mean, we have an example of something that happened um, last year. I'm not going to touch on it too much because it's a little bit of a touchy subject and the person might actually come back to our business. But we had someone leave our company last year for the, for the first time. Uh, for the first time ever, actually. We, we've had such a strong culture and such a strong company that we've only had one person leave ever in 12 years. Sure, we've we've fired a bunch of people that we felt were not good enough, but in terms of leaving, we've only had one person ever leave our company. This one person left last year. Why? Because they thought it was greener on the other side. They thought there was more money on the other side. Quickly, they found out that they were wrong in two areas. Not only was there not as much money on the other side, at least in the short term, but they also found out that the culture wasn't as good on the other side. The business partners were not that friendly. They weren't that understanding. They weren't that accommodating. They weren't that respectful. They weren't that honest. They weren't even really paying accurately what they said they were even going to pay and stuff. And that's just an example where it's like it could be easy. And I guess right now I'm kind of maybe I'm speaking to people that have a job, right? Because we kind of went on this train of thought, but it's like if you have a job and you're looking for another one or something, it's not recommended that you just look for more money. It's recommending where we recommend that you you go where the money is good, but the culture is fantastic because if the culture is bad, if the boss is like not a good guy, it, it's just you could be making more money and miserable, and then you could find yourself looking for a third job and a fourth job and stuff. So what I recommend people do is if they're unhappy with their pay and unhappy with their um, company's culture, I would say that is probably best thing to look for another job. But what I would say on the flip side is if you're happy with the pay if the pay's f decent or fine but you're really happy with the culture i would just stay because you know pay could also be negotiated i mean i know in our company if someone is really performing it's really in our best interest to give them a pay raise as well um just because of performance and stuff you know what i mean so that's what I just recommend is I recommend sticking where the culture is good and not only be thinking about the money because if you're only thinking about the money, you could definitely make a mistake of um, switching to another job because the money is higher or appears to be higher at face value. I think what happened with this other, with this employee that left, they actually, it was like a bait and switch, believe it or not. They, they offered this person like $20,000 a month and then it was just a, it was just an entry like literally they, they offered this person 20 grand a month and then by month three or four, this person found out that the 20,000 wasn't for real. They were, it, they changed it. They said, oh, oh, we can't afford 20,000. They literally brought this, I mean, the whole thing is so like, so it's kind of dark, really. Like they, they brought the person over on the guise of like this $20,000 a month thing 
And then a couple months into it, they just defaulted on the whole $20,000 a month promise. And they just said, okay, you know, we can't support that. And it's going to be more performance and it's not, it's going to be something lower than 20. So it's like they literally bait and switch this person to leave our company for another company under the guise that it would be more money. And then they paid, I think they paid the person the more money if they even did that. Like, it, the more money was just not even true. It was just a lie, right? So it's like, you got to be very, very careful. You got to trust, you know, the company you're working with and be happy with the team and culture. And don't just be chasing a higher dollar amount. Don't be chasing a higher salary, a higher percentage. There's more than just is really more than just money. Again, in my personal life, I would much rather be earning a good or healthy amount of money and be really happy than to be earning some exuberant amount of more money and be unhappy, right? Like what's, no one wants to be unhappy. So guys, that's my wisdom for today. I hope you like this um, audio. If you go ahead and share this with some people, I'm actually really excited how this podcast is circulating really nicely. Go ahead and share this with a few people you know in the industry. Maybe repost it. I've seen some posts on LinkedIn and Twitter, Facebook, stuff like that. Go ahead and repost. Share it with some co, you know, share share it with some other people you know, some business partners, some friends in the industry. Share it around. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share. And have yourself a good weekend and... We'll talk next week. All right.